All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar is called uh, A New Paradigm of Cancer Care for Adolescents and Young Adults. A framework for action, implications for CAFC. Uh, a framework for action and implications for uh, CAFC. Uh, we have uh, with us today. We have uh, two of the co-chairs from the Canadian Task Force for Adolescents and Young Adults with Cancer. First up, we will have Dr. Paul Rogers, who's a clinical investigator for the Child and Family Research Institute in Vancouver, British Columbia. He's also a clinical professor in the Division of Hematology and Oncology in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of British Columbia. And he's also uh, the program head at the division in the Division of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology at BC Children's Hospital. And he'll be up first with us. Uh, we will also have uh, Brent uh, Dr. Brent Schachter, who uh, is also a hematologist and oncologist in uh, at the uh, uh, in Manitoba at the Children's Hospital in Manitoba and with the University of uh, Manitoba. And he's also with uh, Cancer Care Manitoba as well. Uh, and he's also the co-chair of uh, C uh, Canadian Task Force on uh, for Adolescents and Young Adults with Cancers. So with that being said, I'm going to hand the uh, virtual podium over to uh, Dr. Paul Rogers, and we will uh, ask him to, uh, to teach us a little bit about uh, this new framework for action and the implications for uh, CAPC. Thank you, Doug, um, and thank you for all those who are in attendance. Um, uh, the task force is trying to uh, advocate as much as possible and communicate as much as possible to show that this uh, cohort of cancer patients is different. And basically, we want to show that the spectrum of disease uh, due to the biology of the cancer and that their development status and their particular psychosocial needs makes this cohort very much different from the pediatric cohort or the older cohort. And in many parts of the world, uh, the care of adolescents and young adults with cancer, which I'll continue to refer as AYA, uh, is, the, is a, a problem and that they are uh, affected by disparities of care. And this is no different in Canada, where there is a problem in the patient that we are population-based rather than patient-centric. And to improve the situation, we need to actually show that there is a difference of these patients and that the paradigm shift that our title indicates is what is needed. So in Canada, we have established a task force under the auspices both of the C17 group, which is the cohort of pediatric cancer centers, as well as under CPAC, the Canadian Partners Against Cancer, who have funded uh, this task force. And we have been mandated to come up with a set of recommendations and a framework for action, which we have done and which we will be presenting in uh, this uh, webinar and trying to indicate that all the pediatric healthcare centers across Canada should be involved and we need you to be involved. So who are the AYA patients? Uh, there are a difference in definitions, but predominantly most people agree that they are between the ages of 15 to 29. Um, if you take this group of patients, there are at least 2,300 cancer cases in Canada, which is 1.5% of the total cancers. And of these patients, at least 300 die per year. The problem with cancer, which makes it different from other chronic diseases in childhood that require transition adulthood. Um, and transition is a, is a component of what we're talking about, but it is not the only component. AY cancer is both an acute life-threatening event in the lifetime of these uh, patients, but it is also a chronic disease. We have too many patients who are disabled either by the disease itself or unfortunately the treatment that we give them. So the lower limit of age is 15, uh, the upper limit of age is 29. Some centers actually only take it at 25. The 39 in brackets is that uh, the YAC group, the uh, Young Adults uh, Ca Cancer Canada, uh, look at the survivorship uh, as a big problem and take the age up to 39. But for the purposes uh, of the task force, we've taken it up to 29. So this is 2% of all invasive cancers. There is a considerable death toll per year. And what is different, again, from older patients, we have to look not just at the actual death rate or mortality, but the potential life years lost or saved. 
and this is greater than any other cohort, obviously with the exception of the pediatric cohort, where even more life years are lost or saved. And this is one of our survivors' quotes at Saxpac, one of my patients. We may be rare, but we are still there. So again, what is unique about them? The most important uniqueness is, is that they are in a very turbulent development stage of life. They may have just be leaving home, they may just be starting careers, they may just be starting university, they are trying to become independent. And so th as we all know, you know, AYA patients uh, are a difficult group to treat uh, and they are different, uh, different group to parent uh, because of this status that they're going through. On top of that, there is a different biology of the cancers that we see. And they are not well treated by this dichotomy that we have in Canada, where we have really very separate pediatric centers and adult centers, and they fall between the cracks. And adding to the problem which I've alluded before, if you just take the ages between 20 and 39 in Canada, one in 640 individuals now will be a survivor of a cancer and at least a third of them will have one serious sequelae from the treatment of this disease. So survivorship component and continuing to have to follow them up and offer good health care is a very important component, which is more serious than the older age group. So here's one of your questions. What are the top causes of mortality in the overall adolescent and young adults, if you take all uh, adolescent young adults in the population? What is the top cause of mortality? And I think you can type in your question. I'll give you a little time to do that. But obviously this is kind of a leading question. Yeah, so some of the uh, responses that are coming in are suicide and homicide. And again, just a reminder, just type in uh, any an uh, accidents uh, seems to be a popular one as well. Um, you just uh, type in your, your responses into that question box and we'll... Uh, Seems like accidents is winning by quite a bit. <laughs> uh, someone has suggested it's accidents followed by cancer. Well, we've obviously got a very uh, informed group. So after homicide, suicides, and unintentional injury, which lumped in at all that, cancer is second. So, uh, you know, it's not AIDS, it's not cystic fibrosis, it's not pneumonia, it's not other grouping of all infectious disease cancer is the second most common cause of death in this group. So it, it has a significant impact uh, on the societal cost. So as alluded before, why is it a unique stage of life, as you can see there? Um, you know, the third one, romantic relationships and family planning. This is a time where people get into relationships. How can they sustain them when they've got cancer? And how does this affect their general well-being? And there are the medical and psychosocial needs. One of the problems that I'll show a little bit further is a problem of delayed diagnosis in this group. We do have a problem of accrual to clinical trials. And then the psychosocial, the forced dependence of this group who are trying to become independent. And the small number of cancers, you know, it's only 2%, it does not reflect the personal and societal costs of this population. The potential years lives lost or saved and the decreased productivity and quality of life due to the impact of the disease during the formative years, as well as these long-term complications. And why is there delayed diagnosis? Uh, there's quite a lot that's been written about this, and the, uh, uh, we have done a surveillance in, uh, across Canada and have shown in actual fact that the, the delay in diagnosis is almost twice that of the pediatric age group. So what are the reasons? There's probably a sense of denial. Sometimes it's a cost factor in seeking medical advice. Uh, advice. Um, frequently, these patients do not have a consistent family doctor or a practitioner who follows them. And also, one of the problems uh, and uh, in our survivor group uh, seminars, we have found that frequently it is delayed diagnosis, but the healthcare providers don't recognize that cancer in actual fact occurs in this cohort. And as I've alluded to already, the problem of survivorship, this is an ongoing problem that once they've got over their cancer, they faced a lifetime problem and at least a third of them of having ongoing concerns due to the disease or the treatment. So here's your multiple choice question. 
what proportion of survivors of cancer in childhood will experience adverse sequelae from their treatment? In fact, I've indicated the answer already. Uh, okay, so anybody who said 30 or 35% is really correct because we didn't put in 33 and a third. <laughs> so, but so it is a significant, and this is serious sequelae. Uh, in the study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, they showed in actual fact that nearly 60% of the patients, if you add another third, had minor sequelae. So only a third of the patients really escape with no long term health problems. Um, so, Again, what makes a difference to the outcome of these patients? And locus of care, we do believe, does make a, a difference. The healthcare system and providers make a difference, the infrastructure and the treatment, including access to clinical trials. This will all uh, have an uh, effect on total outcome. Again, are they urban or rural populations, their ability to get to the appropriate center? In the United States, there's obviously a difference between public and private institutions academic and non-academic institutions, adult versus AYA units versus pediatric units, the clinical trial availability, and obviously very important is the healthcare professional expertise. Are they used to dealing with this AYA cohort? And this is disturbing because only in both Canada and US, only 30 to 40% of adolescents, this is not even the young adults, are treated in pediatric cancer centers. And it has been well established that there, in some of the diseases that we see in this age group, there is a survival advantage of whether you're treated on a pediatric type protocol or an adult protocol. And this has best been studied in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And there are also some evidence in some of the solid tumors, such as in Ewing sarcoma. So what is the overall survival? The overall survival is actually fact reasonable. And these are cancer statistics looking at the 92 to 95 group and the 2001 to 2005 group. And as you can see, of all cancers, these patients, approximately between 80 to 85% of the patients will be a survivor of this cancer. And there is the breakdown there that you can follow down of the different types of cancers that are most frequently seen uh, in this cohort. So, um, Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is one of the biggest groups. Thyroid is quite big, uh, as well as soft tissues, uh, sarcomas, and central nervous uh, system sarcomas. Whereas leukemia is the most predominant in the childhood age group, it is not that predominant in this age group. So in uh, British Columbia, we have a surveillance um, linkage study where we are trying to link the survivors of our patients aged 0 to 24 and look at their outcomes. And we've been looking really at their healthcare utilization as well as their overall outcome. And just this is not on the slide, but healthcare utilization of this group uh, over and above a control group is at least double uh, in terms of utilizations of prescriptions, the uh, readmissions into hospital uh, and hospital visits. Um, so we have looked at the outcome of patients treated between the ages of 12 and 16, which have been predominantly treated at BC Children's Hospital, and those beyond at 17 to 24, predominantly treated through the cancer agencies. And you can look at these three areas, and uh, eras, and the 12 to 16, obviously we are started to improve, and by now we're you know, above 80%. In fact, we're at least 85% of this age group will be survivors. But if you take the 17 to 24 in the 19 to 95, you can see there is no difference in improvement from the previous cohort. So why is this? Why are the AYA patients not improving in their survival as much as the pediatric age group and uh, as what we can see in the older age group? And this is uh, an important article that was published looking at the different survival and giving some of the reasons of uh, the difference in survival in the different age cohorts. This is what I alluded to uh, in about ALL protocols, uh, and this is in different countries. These are cooperative groups of where the patients were treated in a pediatric-like protocol in a pediatric institution versus the adult group. And you can see the distinct difference in the survival advantage uh, in nearly all these countries for the pediatric-treated uh, type patients. Again, uh, this is from Canadian data of the difference in registration. This is PROGO, the Pediatric Oncology Group of Ontario, versus the Ontario Cancer Registry. 
and most of the patients on POGO will be treated according to a specific clinical trial. But going from the age of 15 up to 19, by the time of age 19, zero patients are registered with POGO, which means they will be at a survival disadvantage. This is a very interesting statistic uh, from Australia, uh, comparing survival advantage in the uh, different age groups uh, between Australia and the United States. Uh, and this is the improvement in relative survival. So you can see that from the ages approximately 15 to 35, the improvement in survival, both in Australia and United States, is less, uh, is better in the younger and better than older, but not good in this AY age group. And again, in Australia, you can see a difference in the different age groups between survival. Why is Australia doing better than the United States? There are probably several reasons from this. One of them is slightly um, artifactorial in that because in the AY age group, uh, melanoma is quite frequent. And obviously, melanoma caught early uh, is a very good survival advantage. But nevertheless, locus of care is an issue, not only the actual institute, but even the country. And this, again, is clinical trial accrual. More children are accrued to clinical trials. More older adults are accrued to clinical trials. But this AYA group is very poor. And in Canada itself, we have estimated that only a 2% of all our AYA patients are actually entered on a clinical trial to look for improvement uh, in treatment. Just look at the uh, one side of, uh, of this graph where the, uh, where the p-value is. And this is a, a, a complicated slide from Dr. Archie Blyer, who is uh, our sort of godfather of AYA uh, investigation, showing that accrual to a clinical trial actually does equate to improvement in absolute outcome. We've shown this in pediatrics for a long time, but it can be shown in the AYA cohort as well. So there are essentially two different clusters uh, uh, that we see in this age group. There are those with very high survival rate, Hodgkin's lymphoma, testes, thyroid cancer, melanoma, where we are getting between 90, 90 to 99%. But there is another group and some of these are the more invasive cancers, uh, the sarcomas, the CNS tumors, where there is less than 60% uh, 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 survival rate and where the overall survival is between 40 and 75%. So we have a very good group, but we have a bad group as well. And what are the reasons why age is a poor prognostic factor? And again, these are multifactorial, different biological spectrum, uh, the uh, the actual treatment, as I've alluded to, may be different uh, with an ALL patient, whether they're treated in an adult or a pediatric unit. Uh, the treatments may be less available, the intensive uh, treatments less available in the adult units. Um, older patients may not tolerate the intensive treatment that we give to pediatric patients. There's definitely a problem in patient compliance, or the new word is uh, adherence to therapy. Um, we can show that, again, biology makes a difference in the pharmacology and pharmacogenetics may be different as you grow older. Supportive care is definitely a component where we are fortunate in pediatrics often to have better supportive care backup than in our adult units and especially in the psychosocial setting. I've alluded to the fewer patients on clinical trial, the locus of care, and probably many other unknown factors. So an impetus in North America came from the National Cancer Institute to look at the outcomes of these patients and to try and bring a, a consortium together to evaluate this. And this was the, uh, um, the consensus opinion from the National Cancer Institute, uh, which you can get online and uh, make considerable uh, recommendations in there, uh, much of which we've tried to follow here in Canada. So you need to identify the unique characteristics. Education, training, and communication, improving awareness that cancer does occur in these patients, that they are not uh, actually improving in survival, and that especially the psychosocial component is really neglected. And we need to create the tools to improve our study of these patients. Um, 
ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, has made a focus of this, and uh, this is their website for looking at a focus under 40. Again, some people going up to the age of 39, but just focusing on adolescents and young adults that this cohort does need to be thought of differently from the other two cohorts. The Children's Oncology Group, which uh, all uh, the uh, pediatric centers in Canada belong to, all the pediatric uh, cancer centers, that is, um, we all try and uh, participate in the clinical trials uh, of Children's Oncology Group. Again, on the premise that participating in clinical trials does lead to improved survival. And uh, within Children's Oncology Group, they have established uh, an AYA committee of which uh, both Ronnie A. Barr and I belong. And the, the, the mandate is to try and increase the clinical trial accrual for this group and to improve the transitions in care. So they are trying to form a lot of collaborations with the adult uh, cooperative clinical trial groups and to open up the studies that are COG studies, increase the age to which their patients are eligible and open them up through the adult uh, cooperative groups. So this is a joint combined um, availability of protocols through both the COG and the adult, uh, uh, adult cooperative groups. By thus, we can um, combine the expertise, the disease treatment expertise, like pediatric oncologists don't really know how to treat uh, melanomas, but obviously the adults do. But a lot of these patients may occur in the AY age group. So combining this expertise will uh, lead to better outcomes and hopefully uh, more clinical trials. And uh, what, some of the reports that have come here, this is a, one of the uh, the articles that has been in the Journal of Cancer Survivorship, uh, looking at where the different disciplines and the late effects of this uh, AY uh, group, and this is a, a good article to use as a reference. One of the models that uh, we really like, uh, the UK probably has the gold standard currently for treating AYA patients. Uh, due to philanthropy, uh, the Teenage uh, Trust um, was established by parents of an AYA patient, and uh, they have been incredibly successful in establishing specific AYA treatment units. And the first one was established at the Middlesex Hospital in London in 1990. And there are the, some of the reasons of why and how they did it. And now there are 17 such specific units combining pediatric and adult medical oncology expertise to treat this cohort of patients. Many of the reasons are listed here of how to improve the communication between the caregivers and the patient. An important component of AY care is empowerment of the patient themselves, that they feel that they have somebody to listen to, that they feel that they can make decisions themselves. It's not just their parents. They have an opportunity to be involved in their own care and learn how to cope with this life-threatening disease at this fundamentally important uh, developmental age group. The teenage unit has in itself a responsibility to the community to improve the, the understanding, both in the schools and in the universities, uh, for patients who are undergoing cancer treatment and are survivors of these cancer treatment by offering advice on how to talk to these patients. So uh, it's not just the patients themselves, it's reaching out to the communities and where these patients are actually living their lives that we can inform people more about the concerns of these patients. Um, as I say, how to talk to young patients, the educational manager within these units who's going out in the community and they're covering the topics with healthcare professionals about the diagnosis awareness and that you need to think. Uh, in the UK, they've shown that the AYA patient visits their general practitioner nearly four times before they are eventually diagnosed with a cancer. The actual physical environment is an important component that the, in, the, in the patient reviews. They want to be in an age-appropriate environment, that they can have their televisions, their, their Xboxes, uh, their computers, the ability to relax and talk to their peers so they can have co-support. So the physical environment 
It is no good for a 16-year-old to be in the same room as a four-year-old. It is no good for a 20-year-old to be in the same room as a 70-year-old. They need to be in age-related environment. This is one of the environments at the Newcastle Hospital Teenage Cancer Unit. And as you can see, just by the very environment, it lends to what this cohort of patients like. So we want to uh, get to that level. Having specific units in Canada is probably down the road at least uh, uh, 10 to 15 years. But we can start to communicate between the pediatric oncologist and the adult oncologist, the radiation oncologist, the hematologist that treat the leukemias. And one of the uh, models that has been shown to work is in Australia, where they create virtual groups. And we need to create, for example, in BC, we want to create a virtual group between BC Children's Hospital and the big centers that treat the, uh, would otherwise treat AYA patients. Vancouver General, BC Cancer, Victoria, and Surrey. So we want to create a team that will help address the problems at these different sites with respect not only to the cancer treatment itself, but very specifically for the psychosocial support so, so desperately required. So we are trying to uh, create uh, AY multidisciplinary teams uh, across BC, and this is uh, something that uh, Brent will be talking about in the developing of what we call RAPS across the country. We do want, um, whether it be in a pediatric unit or an adult unit, that you consider having separate spaces and a unique environment for the, these patients, and the importance of identifying key role healthcare providers who will focus on this uh, AYA group um, and having somebody who will help coordinate between different units uh, is an essentiality to create this virtual group. So I'm now handing over to Brent, uh, hopefully he is there, uh, to talk about what we have been doing in Canada and how uh, CAPHCC can help us, especially in the uh, pediatric healthcare centers. So Brent, are you there? Yes, I am, Paul. Okay. <laughs> After I hand over to you. Um, uh, okay. So, uh, and Doug, yes, I, I will advance the slides from my computer. Okay. Um, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, technology sometimes um, uh, conspires to defeat us, but I, whoops, um, something is. Uh, I, I'm just handing uh, the, the screen over to uh, to uh, your computer, and and while you're getting ready, uh, feel free to take your time. We did have a couple questions that came in that it might be good to give us a chance to ask a couple questions while you get yourself uh, arranged over on that end of the country. Um, the first question that came in was right up at the beginning. Uh, you were talking about the delay in diagnosis, uh, and it uh, the question is: Is the delay in diagnosis as different if controlled for diagnosis, for example, all cancers versus just osteocarcinoma? Uh, osteo, osteosarcoma. Yeah. Um, I'd have to go back to the original data that we got from our surveillance group, but my recollection is the delay is more frequent in solid tumors than it is in for leukemias, because leukemias will generally present uh, quicker uh, and a blood count will pick it up uh, fairly quickly. But a patient who's got a chronic pain in a leg uh, who may have had uh, uh, minimal trauma may be passed off as just a lump uh, that'll go away. So my recollection is that I think the delay in diagnosis is greater in solid tumors than it is in leukemias. Uh, and you also, uh, uh, when we were talking about the list of adverse uh, sequelae that uh, AYA are challenged with. Can you give an example of what some of the more common or, or more severe sequelae are? Okay, so I've alluded to the number of life years saved. So the further out the patient comes from his original treatment, especially if they've received radiation treatment, there is the increased risk of second malignancies. So for example, if a patient has had um, seen a cranial nervous spinal radiation for a brain tumor, they are at risk 20 years down the line for a thyroid cancer. So as the, as the, the span of time goes by, they're more uh, at risk of certain second malignancies. The other sort of specific problems are, um, most of them are, are often related to radiation, is that you can get significant amount of endocrinological problems, uh, whether it be due thyroid 
or adrenal gland or even growth hormone deficiency in the, in the growth period. So endocrinological problems are, uh, are frequent. Uh, the other problems are related to specific drugs, for example, adriamycin, uh, which can cause cardiomyopathy. Now, this cardiomyopathy may not be picked up during the treatment phase, but can occur uh, 15, 20 years later. We see it uh, in males, for example, who are going to the gym and lifting heavy weights, and they've had previous uh, anthracycline therapy, and they will suddenly go into heart failure. We've seen it in some women who've had high-dose uh, anthracycline in their childhood or AYA period uh, will go into heart failure during pregnancy. So um, um, cardiovascular problems uh, in the long term. There also is, is again the concern of obesity uh, in uh, survivors of patients for again for many reasons as in the general population. But obesity adds to these cardiovascular problems, adds to the increased risk of getting metabolic syndrome. So um, the big things are, are, and again, radiation, if you're radiating the brain, even though these patients are older, there are concerns with cognitive problems uh, down the line as well. So second malignancies, endocrinological problems, specific organ damage, and, and the last one, which is of great concern and is the, considered the second highest concern in the AYA patients is fertility. Um, that either radiation, but usually drug-related, such as cyclophosphamide, these patients may uh, be infertile subsequently. And again, this is obviously a concern uh, to an adolescent, young adult uh, age group. All right. Well, thank you. Um, we did all, you also used the term uh, locus of care at uh, one point during your presentation. I was just wondering, uh, someone has asked if you could just define what you meant by locus of care. Uh, locus of care um, is... Locus of care can go from, uh, I listed it in one slide, it could be rural versus um, urban. It could be academic institution versus non-academic institution. It could be a pediatric unit, an AY unit versus an adult unit. Uh, it could be a, a, um, a unit that has access to clinical trials versus one that doesn't have access to clinical trials. So um, it's an all-encompassing locus of care. It's not just uh, children's hospital versus BC Cancer Agency. There are other components of locus of care um, that I alluded to. And there's just one last question. While we're answering this one, uh, we'll get uh, Dr. Schachter to play his presentation in full screen uh, mode, and then we'll be ready to hand the, the virtual, yeah, just like that. We'll hand the virtual podium over to uh, him in just a second. The final question is, uh, do you ever use child life specialists to educate young adults about their cancer and to do education in the community and schools? Uh, at Children's Hospital, very much so, um, but unfortunately our uh, upper age of admission to Children's Hospital is just before they turn 17, although we are actively trying to uh, increase that to 19, um, but our child life specialists have been asked to go down to the BC Cancer Agency uh, to um, educate people, uh, health staff more there. Uh, um, social workers have been much more involved in doing that as well. Um, but yes, this is one of the concerns that this, the dichotomy that we, the, the resources that we have at Children's Hospital are frequently not available uh, at the adult hospital. All right, thank you. So that's all the questions we have now. So now we'll hand the, the, the virtual podium over to Dr. Schachter, who is normally in Manitoba, but is currently in Vancouver, I think, at this point. Uh, so we'll uh, hand the virtual uh, podium over to you, Dr. Schachter. Thanks, Doug. Um, and good morning, everyone. So I think Paul has done an excellent job of uh, outlining the background to the issues that uh, AYA uh, patients face. <clears throat> and he's also, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, suggested um, or discussed some of the initiatives that have been taken in the UK, the United States, and Australia with respect to AYA. Well, of course, um, what, what about Canada? Um, well, um, what I'm going to describe over the course of the next half hour or so is uh, some of the steps that have been taken in Canada to address the, the AYA issue. And there are really four parts to this. I'm going to be talking about the AYA task force that was created, about the recommendations for AYA uh, care in Canada that uh, have, uh, were adopted by the task force and are currently being disseminated. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the communication strategies that we've undertaken and finally about our framework for action and where we, uh, where we are now and where we intend to go. So um, the task force 
is a joint initiative of C17 and the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. Uh, Paul, myself, and Ronnie Barr are co-chairs of this initiative, have been since it uh, began about five years ago. And it really is to address the needs of, I believe it was Archie Blyer that reflect, reflected that the AYA is a lost tribe. Um, because AYA with cancer are a constituency that face disparities of care. In a nation which having a population-based cancer control program and public health system should be in a position to address these issues quite quite well. Now, improving this situation will mean that AYA can benefit not only from the current state of knowledge regarding optimal cancer care, but also from research directed uh, towards the specific needs of this population. Uh, the mission of the Canadian Task Force in Adolescents and Young Adults with Cancer is to ensure that AYA Canadians with cancer and AYA survivors of cancer have prompt, equitable access to the best care and to establish and support research to identify how their health outcomes and health-related quality of life can be optimized. The mission of our task force is to mitigate the current disparities of care for AYA with cancer or survivors through advances in treatment and research respecting the unique circumstances and needs of this population and enacted across all healthcare jurisdictions in Canada. So when we organized the task force in 2008, 2007, 2008, <clears throat> with the support of uh, CPAC and uh, C17, uh, we set out five objectives, major objectives. And these were to document cancer care for adolescents and young adults with respect to the referral, diagnosis, treatment, psychosocial support, and post-treatment follow-up. And I'm going to detail in a few minutes uh, uh, the, re the results of that uh, uh, survey. Uh, to ascertain patterns and transition models of long-term follow-up of survivors of pediatric malignancies when they attain adulthood. To establish recommendations for the provision of health care to AYA uh, in order to improve their overall outcomes and quality of life. And we'll be talking about that in more detail uh, a little bit later as well. To develop lines of communication between pediatric and adult health care providers to promote continuing improvement in the health care provided to AYA with cancer and to survivors of cancer as children are AYA. And of course, this is most important because that transition and that handoff is uh, often uh, want, found wanting. And to identify research priorities and, and facilitate action on them related to cancer and its sequelae in AYA. So in order to do this, we established a number of working groups. Um, Working groups, uh, one's uh, mandate was to uh, survey uh, cancer care for AYA with respect to referral diagnosis and psychosocial support in Canadian pediatric and adult cancer centers. And that, uh, and I'm going to detail that just to, in just a few moments, but uh, that has now been published in the Journal of Adolescent and Young Adult Oncology as indicated. Working group two's mandate was to uh, uh, look at patterns and models of long-term follow-up of survivors of cancer in childhood and the AYA age group, and a position statement concerning the needs of AYA with cancer during transitions of care has been uh, done, and there is some activity around uh, translating that into a manuscript. Working Group 3, um, which I chaired, was to develop recommendations for the provision of health care to AYA with cancer and to survivors in order to improve their overall outcomes and quality of life. And that is also, uh, was also published in the, um, uh, the first volume uh, of the Journal of Adolescent and Young Adult Oncology uh, in 2011. Working Group 4, which Paul chaired, was uh, to develop uh, a communication strategy on AOA Oncology um, and uh, between pediatric, pediatric and adult cancer care providers and between these constituencies and other relevant stakeholders, including healthcare administrators and policymakers, and we'll talk more towards the end of this uh, presentation around how that has been, how we're attempting to accomplish that. Working Group 5 uh, was looking at short-term research priorities, which included improving clinical trial access and accrual, uh, to do a national survey of oncofertility services, and to link with CIPC, the Cancer and Young People in Canada initiative funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada to look uh, more carefully at surveillance and, and ongoing at the surveillance of AOIA with cancer. Working Group 6 uh, was to develop a postgraduate training program 
which would lead to the award of a diploma in AYA Oncology from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. And that is, um, that is, has, uh, uh, I believe, received uh, provisional approval from the Royal College at this point in time. So that is uh, something that we're very proud of. So with regard to the AYA Task Force survey, a questionnaire about services available to AYA cancer patients and for follow-up care of survivors of cancers as children or AYA was developed by a working group of the AYA Task Force. The questionnaires were mailed between April 15th and May 13th. Uh, in 2009 to C-17 uh, council members who of course represent all the pediatric cancer centers in Canada and to all the cancer treatment institutions listed by the Canadian Association of Provincial Cancer Agencies, CAPCA, and the Lutte contre le Cancer in Quebec. Um, now, uh, these are complicated slides. Um, and basically, it was looking at the challenges faced by institutions, this one looks at the challenges faced by institutions who reported treating patients outside their institutional age limits. And the responses are through both, from both pediatric and from adult groups. And um, you can see that hospital rules and policies were a huge barrier. Um, getting other specialties to see patients in the pediatric setting getting patients seen in the emergency room, getting patients admitted were all issues. Um, and uh, in, for the, in the pediatric group, um, in the adult group, uh, perhaps the largest <clears throat> problem was the staff's lack of comfort in providing age-appropriate medical and psychosocial support. Um, but there definitely were challenges on both sides of the fence with regard to uh, the transition of care uh, of patients uh, sort of that are on the bubble with respect to age. So the percent of it, and then this slide demonstrates the percent of institutions who deem uh, a factor important to the diagnosis of treatment of AYA with pediatric or adult uh, cancer. Um, lack of experience of oncologists uh, was a problem on both sides of the fence because of course these are, this is a, as, again a transition group and the biology and the incidence of various kinds of cancers is changing. So um, this was a, a real big issue. Uh, there was, to some extent, limited access to appropriate specialists uh, for consultation, lack of experience of pathologists, lack of experience of surgeons, radiologists, pharmacists, and limited availability of appropriate drugs. And most of these issues were a larger issue on the adult side of the, uh, of the spectrum uh, than on the pediatric side. Um, when we asked about staff with special expertise or interest in AYA, uh, again, um, in oncology, pediatric group um, uh, scored larger than the, the medical group, although surprisingly, 50% of the adult responses suggested there were uh, individuals with ex special expertise or interest in AYA. Of course, adolescent medicine specialists are, is entirely within the pediatric uh, uh, spectrum. Um, and otherwise, um, uh, perhaps what's most surprising, of course, is the actual rather low response in both pediatric and adult groups with respect to adolescent uh, nurse specialists, adolescent life specialists, participant, patient, parent, patient advocates, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers were a bit better, but again, only 50% had special expertise. So this is an area that really does need attention with respect to developing individuals' interests and expertise in this area. Uh, what about dedicated AYA resources? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> certainly on the pediatric side, there were age-specific programs to help with school-related issues. Um, age-specific health education materials were present. Um, uh, but in all of these areas, certainly, You'll notice that the upper, <laughs> the upper limit of this graph uh, on the abscissa is 50%. So there are all these programs and all these needs that could be characterized as important for AYA patients are found wanting in both pediatric and adult, uh, in adult groups. Um, so in the adult group, uh, which best describes your facility's usual plan for follow-up care of AYA who have received all or part of their cancer therapy to your facility after the conclusion of their active treatment? Well, um, uh, you'll see that the large majority, 52.4%, were followed periodically in an active treatment clinic, but are also followed by their family physician. And then there's um, 
I think the 14.3% is other mechanism. And there are modicum, 5 to 10%, that are followed in dedicated survivor clinics, uh, which are probably the best alternative, or followed in a disease-specific active treatment clinic, or discharged and transferred back to their family physician, 9.5%, I believe, uh, or discharged from cancer care center without a formal plan for follow-up care. And um, I believe that was uh, something like 5% uh, as well, which, of course, is the worst possible outcome. And, of course, there were combinations of both of those. <clears throat> so it's obvious that there is no uniformity. And um, I think that anyone uh, looking at this in an objective fashion would say that it's not adequate overall. Uh, Again, with respect to the adult survey, where are patients seen in your facility if you see patients who received all their therapy at a pediatric center? 12% roughly were in a dedicated survivor clinic. Um, about 47% were in a disease-specific active treatment clinic, and the remainder were managed in a number of different ways. The uh, <clears throat> Again, on the adult side, the question was asked, does your center accept for ongoing care and follow-up patients who have received all their therapy at a pediatric oncology facility? And the surprising response to me was that 22% of these centers said no. 78% um, said yes. Um, one really wonders then, it, it almost sounds as if in some of these places, roughly 25%, a quarter of them, um, these patients and survivors are kind of uh, left uh, to uh, to the um, to their family practitioners or just uh, abandoned in a sense and and this is certainly not what is uh, what is needed for this population of patients or what is uh, really the best uh, the best option and then uh, another question in your facility how important are the following in the diagnosis and treatment of AYA and uh, in terms of importance index, uh, the order was lack of experience of oncologists was the first issue uh, in both adult and pediatric centers. Lack of experience of surgeons came up in a second in both. Um, lack of experience of radiologists in pediatric centers was an issue and uh, limited access to appropriate specialists for consultation and lack of experience of pathologists in adult centers was an issue. So overall, one ha would have to say <clears throat> that a number of deficiencies that would result in um, uh, deficiencies and, and perhaps difficulties and inadequate, perhaps, AYA care were documented by this rather comprehensive survey that we did um, very early in the course of the AYA task force. So what do you do next? Well, we organized a workshop on adolescents and young adults with cancer to look at developing better outcomes <clears throat> in Canada. And this was held in the spring roughly two years ago, uh, no, three years ago now, excuse me, March 11th to 13th, 2010 in Toronto, and we invited about 100 uh, people, a, a wide spectrum of activities, both in terms of, um, both in terms of uh, uh, those that treat these patients, and we had a large number of survivors, about 20, uh, or patients with uh, AYA cancers, about 25%. And um, and some uh, some distinguished uh, visitors from uh, around the world, really. And this was organized uh, by the task force with the support of C17, CPAC, and CPAC. So, um, without going into any detail about the workshop itself, which we thought was very successful, there was a lot of uh, a lot of enthusiasm demonstrated. Whoops, um, five or actually six themes. Um, uh, emerged from the workshop uh, that required uh, attention uh, with respect to improving AYA care in Canada. Uh, those were awareness and advocacy, active therapy and supportive care, palliation and symptom management, psychosocial needs, survivorship, and research and metrics. And I might mention <clears throat> that the proceedings of the workshop were published as a supplement to cancer on May 15, 2011, and um, I know that Ronnie Barr has at one time had about 300 copies of this in his office at McMaster. And uh, so if you <laughs> contact Sonia after, after this, uh, if you're interested in receiving a copy, there may still be some available for those of you who wish to have, to have it in place. The other outcome of the, um, of the workshop was uh, the working group three uh, of the task force 
were given its marching orders and uh, then proceeded over the course of the next year to develop principles and recommendations for the provision of health care in Canada to adolescents and young adult aged cancer patients and survivors. And as mentioned, that was published in a Journal of Adolescent and Young Adult Oncology in May of 2011 as well. Um, now, the recommendations, and I'm, there, there is much more detail in the paper, um, <clears throat> and we can certainly provide the, um, the reference to those, to, to those of you who are interested in it. But I'm, I'm just going to go through the, um, the, the broad, the broad rec six recommendations that were made. Um, and if you wish more detail, you can certainly consult the paper itself. <clears throat> Active therapy and supportive care. Services must be provided to address the unique needs of AOAs with cancer and survivors of cancer in childhood, adolescence, and adulthood in order to redress inequities in the care provided to this group relative to both younger and older cancer patients, as Paul has described. Psychosocial needs, AYA with cancer have unique psychosocial needs that must be met to enable each one to reach their full potential as a productive functioning member of society. Palliation and symptom management, the challenge of providing palliative care to AYA patients who have unique needs related to their developmental stage must be addressed. Survivorship, implementation of lifelong monitoring and follow-up of survivors of cancer in childhood, adolescence, and young adulthood will provide economic and other societal benefits and help mitigate late and long-term treatment effects. And uh, <clears throat> research and metrics, research and establishment of outcome metrics are required to investigate issues critical to AYA uh, in order to target interventions and healthcare policy to improve all phases of the cancer journey. And finally, awareness and advocacy. Awareness of issues specific to AYA uh, must be improved and advocacy efforts to increase awareness and advocate for change must be nurtured. So those were the, uh, those are the, the, the broad recommendations that were made. Um, we also, uh, at that point, um, developed a communication strategy um, <clears throat> which, uh, which we're utilizing to, move, to help us move forward. Our first strategy was to build consensus around the task force definition of the AYA population and its vision of the future. Second was to adopt an inclusive approach to creating the AYA framework, and the target audience includes those of you who are on this uh, webinar today, but certainly patient groups, oncologists, cancer agencies, hospitals, and professional associations. Third strategy was to and very important, engage both the adult and pediatric oncology community, communities, oncologist communities to bring them up to speed. So both adult and pediatric oncologists and specialty societies need to be engaged with this, and there have been a number of opportunities to do this, including today's, uh, I, would, uh, I would surmise, as well. Uh, but this is an issue that really needs to be uh, brought to be top of mind, um, and I was actually just at a uh, a workshop last night where it was mentioned uh, that this is an important issue in, in Western Canada, and not by me. Strategy number four, emphasize the economic and social benefits of addressing the AYA issue, and we have to uh, speak with government, healthcare decision makers, and the health media about this. And uh, those are the four broad strategies that we're employing to move this issue, uh, important issue, forward. <clears throat> what we envision for the next five years uh, of our uh, initiative was to take those recommendations, disseminate them, build consensus, build a framework for action, oversee the implementation of that framework, develop mechanisms of sustainability, and overall uh, evaluate. And we're in the course of doing that, and we'll take a little bit of time to describe exactly how we're going about it uh, right now. Um, so what we've... Uh, done is to create a new strategic plan for the second five years. Uh, we've considered uh, and actually are restructuring uh, our, the, uh, the action, the initiative uh, to uh, address uh, provincial and regional needs, uh, which we recognize are different, uh, and there are different levels of activity and um, sophistication and ability to move forward. And every province requires a different approach because of differences in size, geography and uh, the way in which cancer care is implemented in those provinces. We need champions in all jurisdictions, and I'm certainly hoping that, or I think we're certainly hoping that through this webinar, uh, we'll make all of you champions uh, for this cause. It's 
we recognize that it is essential to have an evaluation system in place to document if change makes a difference to outcomes. And since we know the change has to happen at the provincial and jurisdictional level, we've established regional action partnerships, or RAPs, in uh, seven uh, jurisdictions throughout Canada. And those uh, are progressing at a, at a variety of speeds in um, BC, Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and the Atlantic provinces. Um, so. For the, five, the future five years, our primary objective is to develop and implement a framework for action on the AOA task force recommendations for the care of AOA with cancer and survivors throughout Canada. Um, and in order to begin that, we held another stakeholders workshop about a year ago, um, moving to action, because we wanted to take some of these recommendations that we made and see exactly how on the ground we would be able to uh, enact them. Um, so that conference resulted in a framework for action on recommendations for care of AOA with cancer, uh, which uh, which is now uh, has now uh, been put in print. And there are two common areas of focus across all these recommendations: the creation of AYA multidisciplinary teams and the development of tools specific to AYA needs. And all of this, we believe we would certainly like to and we believe can be implemented within a five-year period, or at least begin to do so. Uh, <clears throat> going into this in a bit more detail, with regard to the multidisciplinary teams, the goal is to provide age-appropriate care uh, delivery, uh, which can be delivered and or supported by multidisciplinary teams populated with age and disease-specific medical and psychosocial experts who are able to communicate effectively and provide evidence-based care, including age-appropriate and developmentally appropriate supportive and psychosocial care. And with regard to the tools, every AYA and their care team should have access to specific tools to help improve the quality of care and manage their cancer journey from diagnosis to palliation or survivorship. So what's the organization of the multidisciplinary team structures? We've actually, uh, we've actually created three uh, organizational structures that will work together in concert at the national and regional levels to implement the roadmap. The National Task Force, and I should mention, I, we didn't say very much about it except that it exists, but it does include approximately 20 or 25 members from across the country with a wide range of interests, uh, with the unifying interest being in improving AYA care but really uh, represents a broad uh, cross-section of interests uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and background uh, skills and knowledge. We're also creating national task force working groups as a continuation of what we did uh, initially, but although the objectives of those groups may change somewhat, and perhaps, uh, <coughs> excuse me, at the uh, provincial or regional level, creating regional action partnerships to enact and facilitate the changes that are required uh, to enable improved AYA care. So the National Task Force then assumes a dual role of supporting the RAPS and continuing its leadership work in regards to AYA cancer strategy. The working groups are responsible for developing and implementing strategies at the national level. The outputs of the working groups support the goals of both the National Task Force and the RAPS. The RAPS are responsible, however, for leading implementation of the roadmap in their provinces and territories and for communicating with others at both the national and provincial levels. And going into the role of the RAPS in slightly more detail, uh, they will participate in the further development of the framework for action. They will modify the framework to suit the healthcare system and needs of their particular region. They will communicate with the National Task Force on the modified framework. They will develop effective alliances within hospitals and sub-regions involved in the care of AYA patients. And I think Paul earlier described uh, one strategy uh, that's moving forward in that regard in British Columbia. They will establish models of care for AYA patients who require active care and for long-term follow-up of survivors that are appropriate for that region. And they will advocate for implementation of the framework and models of care within their region to improve the outcomes of AYA with cancer and uh, to also to, with regard to survivors. So what are the implications for CAPHC? Um, it's going to be important to, uh, to consider how we might provide age-appropriate psychosocial support. 
uh, we've told you that uh, we're in the midst of organizing a formal diploma program uh, in AYA oncology within the Royal College uh, for physicians, and that would be oncologists of any stripe. Um, there may be a need to actually think of developing some sort of program of training for age-appropriate, age-specific psychosocial support um, as well. Uh, we need to uh, consider flexible age of admission uh, on the pediatric side. We need to have much better planning for transition to the adult care system, uh, and um, lots of there needs to be lots of work done in that regard. Um, in my estimation, looking from the adult side of the spectrum, uh, and we need combined effort between pediatric and adult systems, and we really need a lot of dialogue and discussion in those areas. So that's really the end of the formal presentation, uh, and uh, uh, Paul and myself are certainly open to questions at this time. All right, thank you. That great presentation. Uh, and again, a reminder, this is your opportunity to type in any questions or comments that you have. Uh, you know, and maybe, uh, Dr. Schachter, you could back up one slide and just leave those recommendations uh, for CAFC just to sort of, uh, or implications for CAFC, just so just to give people a reminder of, of you know, of while they're, while they're percolating their questions. I think Elaine uh, might have, uh, Elaine Orbein, CAFC's president and CEO, is also with us uh, on the virtual panel here. I think she might have had a comment if she's still out there. I am, and, and thanks, Doug, um, to uh, Dr. Schachter and, and Roger. Thank you so much. An outstanding presentation, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Just a couple of uh, more comments, and, and perhaps let me start with one question, um, uh, Brent, to, to, your, to your presentation. The the um, the thing that many things struck me, but one of the things that struck me the most was your comments in terms of the the follow up or maybe shortcomings of the follow up uh, to to the patients and and this I'm going to say was was a little surprising. I'll use a stronger word, shocking. Um, that's that's part of part of uh, you know comment question to you if you could. Uh, that just a wee bit more, and the other the other part in terms of engaging sort of the the full continuum of care in in again following up with our patients in in staying connected with with these with our patients and families. What sort of work is being done or engagement with our community hospitals? Um, that are are so importantly connected to all of our children's hospitals in the country. Yeah. Well, with respect to the first question, yeah, I think this is a, a the transition of care and follow up is a huge issue. Um, <clears throat> I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it goes. Um, to one of the issues here is there's both a systemic structural issue. Uh, with the um, connections between pediatric and adult cancer centers, uh, which in some cases, um, you know, the transition or the transfer of care is not very effective for one reason or another. Sometimes I must say, my impression is that, that the, the patient themselves, the patients themselves contribute to this uh, in the sense that they finish their treatment, it's been a hard go, they've been at it often for two years or more, and they figure, I'm well, <laughs> I'm 20 years old, I'm fine, I don't need to see anyone anymore. I mean, I, I, I call it, I, I don't know if anyone else has called it this, I call it the Superman syndrome, and I've seen it often. Uh, there's also sometimes fear of moving into the adult environment, it's different. They don't want to sit in a waiting room with 70-year-olds, quite frankly. Um, <clears throat> it's, not their, it's not their cup of tea. And um, also, they become very connected and uh, to uh, emotionally connected uh, to uh, to their caregiver in the pediatric system, and to move to someone they don't know is is often very scary. Um, and I mean, I, I'm talking about being the recipient of this because uh, in in our system in Manitoba, certainly um, transfer care is attempted, and we're very fortunate in Manitoba because the pediatric and the adult uh, oncologists work in the same in the same environment, uh, in the same outpatient environment. Our offices are just down the hall from each other. We work very very well together, and yet even in that environment, uh, seeing patients in the same clinic rooms, um, 
uh, the transfer care can be very difficult with some of these patients. So a lot of them, it's, it's not even just making certain that the overall structural organization is adequate. It's providing some sort of psychosocial and educational support to these patients so they understand how important <clears throat> long-term follow-up care is. With respect to going out into the community, you know, to be sent back to a family practitioner, there's there's literature on this in Canada that um, every family practitioner is on average in Canada see their incidents, incident cases of cancer about three per year. How many of them are AYA? Practically none. In other words, what I'm really saying is that to be sent back to a family practitioner for follow-up care when there's a high incidence of uh, complications, long-term complications, I believe is inappropriate because those family physicians are not prepared uh, to, to really understand what needs to be done or what they need to look for in terms of preventing or ameliorating complications. Um, now often they don't have the psychosocial, sometimes they do, in fact, have the psychosocial resources themselves to take care of this, but often they don't. So uh, we do need, really, to provide a, a more welcoming receptor for these patients within the adult cancer environment. And that really is a major issue for everyone uh, at the RAP level and everyone that's involved in these, the patient, care of these patients. So I must admit, I spent such a long time answering your first question, I've forgotten your second one. No, I, I, it, was, it was just the, the second. Actually, you actually have combined both. So I, I'll just um, make a comment, Brent, and, and that is that um, the whole transition from pediatric to adult care is a big, big concern for the CAFSEG community. And I'm sure everyone who is attending our webinar today is nodding their heads, um, you know, are nodding their heads at this point. I just want to share with you um, and all our colleagues that CAFSI is currently building a community of practice that is focused specifically on the transition of care um, from pediatrics to the adult uh, care community. And, and this may, in fact, provide an opportunity for us um, to address that I think that implication um, for CAFC that you've outlined on this slide. So I, I look forward and, and would encourage us to continue this dialogue on how we might address this together. Yeah, well, I certainly commend that, that initiative. I think that's extremely important. If that can serve as a platform to improve transition, I think that will be excellent. Okay. And, and part of that addresses that second question, and that's um, what, is, what are the efforts that are being made to reach out to our community hospitals that are associated with our more um, academic or research children's hospitals? Yeah, exactly. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, we have had a couple of questions uh, where people are, are asking if uh, they will be able to have access to the slides. Now, I don't know if I, if, if, there, there was a lot of data on there. Are we able to share these slides in PDF format with the uh, with the audience? Um, um, I, the majority of the slides, I think, can be shared. There are a couple ones that are borrowed from other talks that I would have to get permission. Okay. Well, what, yeah. what, why don't you guys take them back and, and send me whatever whatever you're willing to uh, allow to be posted publicly, and then we'll we'll get something sure. up on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Sure. Yeah, uh, and I think all, all everything in my presentation, I think, is uh, should should be public access. I see no difficulty with that at all. All right. I don't think we have any difficulty with that part of it. All right, and, great. Uh, maybe the document, uh, Dr. Schachter, that you referred to, the 300 copies in Dr. Barr's office, <laughs> we could get one of those hard copies and put uh, that up on the Knowledge Exchange Network as well. Yeah, that's a series of about 17 or 18 uh, articles within the supplement. Uh, you know what I'm gonna, I would ask you to do is to communicate with Sonia Dupont, who's on this call. Um, she might be in the best position uh, to, to, to deal with that. That sounds perfect. Sounds great. Um, we did, uh, uh, another question has come in. Um, actually, we did have two, a couple questions. One was uh, they were asking if you could advance your, your presentation one slide. They wanted to see the URL that you had there for uh, AYACancerCanada.ca, I believe is what it was. Yeah. yeah. So there it is there. So yeah. 
uh, someone was asking about that. Another question did come in as well about what role do you see nurse practitioners playing in this? Um, I actually think um, that um, there could be a, a, a role for nurse practitioners in this um, in this environment. Um, there's no question that um, that in terms of the development of AYA units, whether they're outpatient or inpatient or combined, um, there needs to be a, a nurse coordinator, someone that plays the role of serving um, as, a, 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 as a recognizable face that the AYA patients in that community can access easily, uh, spend time with, and that can serve to uh, to send them to appropriate resources for whatever questions they may have. And as you know, the questions can be within a very wide spectrum. It, it really becomes um, a, a sort of a navigator role. Um, you know, I mean, and, and those, those nurses also may provide psychosocial support themselves, although I would think that there is a large role for psychosocial support uh, specific support, support within those AYA units as well. But we haven't really thought very much. I, I, I think, you know, we thought more about the clinical nurse specialist role. Nurse practitioners are a little bit different. Um, and uh, But it's something certainly worth, uh, worth thinking very carefully about. Uh, this is Paul. Can I just add a comment on that? Sure. Uh, um, in British Columbia, the Cancer Agency did actually put in an application for a, a nurse practitioner to help in uh, survivorship, which unfortunately was turned down. So we do see uh, specifically a role for nurse practitioner in the uh, uh, running uh, survivorship clinics, uh, but this has to be linked with the formal uh, survivorship program that exists within a province. Um, and can't really stand independently. And and, and currently, as a nurse practitioner role in British Columbia, is they have to be independent um, practitioners. Whereas we feel that they definitely need to be linked to, to the overall survivorship program. So um, there is a move uh, in survivorship that nurse practitioners uh, can and uh, should play a role. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, that uh, you know, again, just another reminder for people to uh, type in any last questions they have. We do have a few more minutes left in our scheduled time. Uh, we don't have any other questions up on the uh, on the board right now. Uh, so if there's any, maybe we'll just move into while if anyone's typing any, you know, the fingers are flying on the keyboard right now, we'll uh, we'll answer your question if it does come in. But perhaps uh, just in preparing preparing for there not to be any other questions, maybe just uh, uh, some final comments from our from our two panelists. Paul. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to do this, and um, uh, you've got the website there, um, you, and uh, Sonia um, Depau is our coordinator for the National Task Force, and uh, can send you a considerable amount of information, uh, as well as the publications that uh, we have already put out. So I, I, I would refer you to Sonia uh, if uh, you want uh, further um, publications. Uh, my, my final comment is that, that this has to be a wide stakeholder uh, cause that is embraced by all the stakeholders. And obviously, CAPC um, is an important stakeholder in moving this forward, especially within the pediatric healthcare ce centers. Um, what, one of my issues, uh, um, which anybody from BC has known, is, is in actual fact the age of admission. Uh, in Seattle Children's Hospital, they have a very flexible age of admission. It is decided where the, that patient is best treated according both to the development and age of the patient as well as the underlying disease. So the arbitrary age of the upper limit as in most centers across Canada is 17. Uh, but this doesn't fit a disease. It just fits uh, a policy. So uh, one of my big appeals is we do really need to be very flexible in treating the developmental and disease in the most appropriate locus of care. Yeah, and um, I, I think uh, I would agree with everything uh, Paul says. I'm. Um, we're also, of course, working, trying to work uh, in, with through the Canadian Association of Provincial Cancer Agencies, which is an umbrella organization of um, uh, the provincial cancer agencies in Canada, to to make certain they understand the importance of um, the development of AYA specific um, 
uh, resources within their organizations. I think they do understand that. Um, all of those organizations have um, have financial uh, constraints, uh, but I think that uh, through the wraps and uh, through uh, advocacy within provinces, I think we will uh, make some inroads. I think we have some very good examples of what can be done, particularly within the UK with the Teenage Cancer Trust, and I think that really serves as a model for uh, at least one model that we might wish to uh, attempt to emulate uh, province to province. <coughs> All right. Well, thank you. The only other question that did come in was about Sonia's contact information, so people can follow up if they do have any other questions. So I did pop up the uh, website and uh, the, the contact uh, section on their website up on the screen now, so you can see that. But, uh, of course, you can always go there anytime at ayacancercanada.ca. And with that, uh, I guess I think we'll wrap this up. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Um, um Sonia is on the uh, conference call. Uh, do you have anything to add, Sonia? And also a thank you from Brent and I for yes. having put these slides together. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Sonia? Uh, oh, I'm unmuted. Yeah, no, I don't have anything else to add. You're very welcome. All right. I did have you muted just for a second there, Sonia, because there was a bit of an echo during uh, Dr. Rogers' portion of the presentation. So. Um, but yeah, no, thank you for uh, all of your help with this as well, Sonia. And thanks to uh, Dr. Rogers and Dr. Schachter. It was a great presentation. I, I, I think we, you know, we, we can see how many people leave the presentation beforehand and we, uh, there wasn't any, everyone was here right until the very end. So uh, I think that's a, a good indicator for us of, of, of the interest in this important topic from across our community. Um, and with that, we'll, we'll close this off. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the, pre the the, portion, the slides that will be made available to me will be made available to you along with the, uh, the audiovisual recording of this presentation. We do post all these on our Knowledge Exchange Network at ken.cafc.org. That's ken.cafc.org. And it'll all go up on this page that you should be able to see on your screen uh, any second now. Um, and uh, this is where we'll put all of the resources and any, and any other links or resources that uh, are made available to us. Uh, we do these webinars every Wednesday at 11 Eastern time, usually, sometimes uh, occasionally outside of that schedule. But you can always go uh, to our website at the CAFC Presents uh, section of the website for more information anytime. There's a calendar of upcoming webinars, a link to uh, join the mailing list so you can be notified of upcoming events and links to the Knowledge Exchange Network so you can find all of the recordings using the search tools uh, and everything else that's available there. Uh, next week we will be, uh, I think we actually might even have a, uh, actually, we do have one uh, webinar next week on Wednesday, March 20th, on transi transitioning of uh, congenital cardiac patients from youth to adult services from our colleagues uh, at the Children's Hospital in Quebec City. Uh, and after that, we'll be taking a, a bit of a break uh, for a couple of weeks before we come back uh, for more webinars after that. But uh, of course, as I mentioned, go to the CAFC Presents section of our website uh, for any further information uh, or upcoming webinars. So thanks again to everyone for joining us and again to our presenters for putting on such a great presentation. And hopefully we'll see you on the next webinar. Bye.